Praise the Lord, everybody. God bless you tonight. And we welcome you to Strength for the Journey, where it's definitely a place you can always come to find strength for your journey. I'm so grateful and delighted once again on tonight to have this tremendous opportunity, this privilege to be able to come into your home and to once again declare the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, to speak out of the volume of the book, to speak from the word of God that is able to give us an inheritance amongst them that are sanctified. Hallelujah. I'm just so grateful for what God has given us on tonight. And I won't be before you long tonight, but we just wanted to jump on and just speak what God has spoken to our hearts on tonight. And so we know that tonight, tonight being Good Friday, is a night where many churches uh, across the country have what we call the last sayings of the Lord Jesus Christ, the seven last words, which we know has been the foundational and traditional uh, aspect of Christianity and Christendom in itself. And so tonight, I want to talk from the subject at the end of the day, what's so good about Good Friday? And so even though we're not going to talk about all seven last words, I am going to talk about at least three or four of them as, as it relates to what it really means to be Good Friday. Have you ever thought about what is so good about the day called Good Friday? And so without further ado, I want to just jump right into the word of God. And again, we're talking from the subject at the end of the day, what's so good about Good Friday? And so I want you to turn with me if you have your Bibles to Matthew's gospel, chapter number 27 at verse and verse number 46, where the word of God says, now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And so tonight we celebrate what we as Christians to believe to be the apex and the pinnacle and the most momentous weekend in the history of the world. And it is a night that we call Good Friday, as we often know, and we all know, but on a night that we call Good Friday, I want to ask you, have you ever really wondered, again, what's so good about the day that we call Good Friday? You know, I have often asked myself, why do we call Good Friday good when it's such a hor horrifying event that commemorates a day of extreme humiliation and extreme suffering that ultimately brought about the death, the death of our Lord Jesus the Christ? As saints of God, you, we all know that we proclaim the cross to be the most decisive turning point for all creation. And we consider it to be the substratum and the foundation of our faith in that Jesus died for our sins in accordance with what God had promised us in all of scripture. But still on tonight, I want to ask you once again, why do we call the day of Jesus's horrifying death Good Friday instead of Bad Friday? Well, in order for us to see the good in what happened on this night and for it to have real meaning for us, we have to first understand it's important for us as saints and as a people of God to understand the bad news of our human condition as sinful people who were all of our lifetime under condemnation and slaves to sin. And we were held all of our life under the penalty of sin. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter number two, verses three and four, that we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature, by nature, the children of wrath, even as others. But God, hallelujah to Jesus, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, the Bible says, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. And by grace, we are saved on today. He has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show us the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. But still, why do we call it Good Friday instead of Bad Friday? Well, I suggest to you tonight that the name Good Friday is appropriate because the suffering and the death of the Lord Jesus, as terrible as it was, marked the dramatic culmination of the plan of God to save you and I from our sins. And the cross upon which Jesus was nailed is where we see the convergence of tremendous suffering, while at the same time we see God's forgiveness. In Psalms 85 and 10, the Bible says that mercy and truth met together. 
and that righteousness and peace kissed each other, which, which rings and sings out to you and I today, when the righteousness and the peace of God would kiss each other, which denotes to you and I tonight, the mercy and the truth of God. And so then the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ is where that indeed took place. And it is where God's wrath converges with his mercy in that now you and I have been made to be the recipients of his divine forgiveness. We are the recipients of his divine mercy and we are the recipients of his divine peace on tonight because of the sacrifice that would take place on Calvary. We've been teaching from the series entitled Submission to Authority for those that have been joining and have been tuned to us on uh, week to week. And it is here where I want to talk about Jesus's submission to the plan of his father that will redeem you and I out of the bondage and out of the penalty of sin. And it shows us how Jesus became resolved, submitted and completely resigned to suffer and take upon himself. Our divine punishment, your punishment and my punishment after wrestling in the Garden of Gethsemane where we see his humanity and his divinity wrestling one with another. Because how many know that Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he did not want to go to the cross. The Bible tells us how he talked to the Father and he had so much agony that he said, God, let this cup pass for me. But how many know that he perseveres through the agonizing mental torture of what would be so horrifying for him that the Bible said, I believe it was Isaiah that told us that his appearance was so marred and his visage was so disfigured that he could not even be recognized. And how many know that Jesus went through all of this because you and I, we were on our way to hell, hallelujah to God. But mm -hmm. because we all have been born into sin, how many know that we don't deserve anything but hell, death, and the grave? But I'm grateful and I'm appreciative to the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice because he knew that we were all born in sin and shaped in iniquity. And how many know that hell is the result of God's righteousness and judgment against sin and all who would reject his saving grace. Thank you, Jesus. But the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter number two, 12, rather in verse two, that it was the joy, hallelujah to Jesus. It was the joy that was set before Jesus that enabled him and to endure the cross and despise the shame. Yeah. And is the very reason why he now sits at the right hand of the throne of God. And it was because of his undying love for you and for me on tonight that is past our comprehension that was the cause of his total submission to the authority of the Father to being the one mediator between God and men. And now, so at the end of the day, at the end of the day, Good Friday is good because on Good Friday, it's on this night, Jesus knew that it would lead to his re resurrection. It led to our salvation and the beginning of God's reign of righteousness and peace in our lives. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why Good Friday is so bad and yet so good. I thought about how we often coin the phrase, you know, when we ask the question, what had happened? And we're responding and our usual response is, you know, you see what had happened was, but... Moving forward, I believe instead of saying, you see what had happened was, we ought to say at the end of the day. And the reason I say that is because at the end of the day, when Jesus now was on the cross, he cries out, Father, into thy hands. As we read in our text in Matthew's gospel, chapter number 27, he says, into thy hands, I commend my spirit. And I was intrigued and I'm so intrigued and inspired with this verse and this text of scripture because this statement points back to the beginning of the day when he first says, Father, forgive them yes. for they know not what they do. And this is important because he says, when he says, Father, it denotes that his connection and his intimate relationship that he had with his father is still intact. But as the clock keeps ticking, his fourth word, which is Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, the scripture says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Becomes a cry of separation and desperation because here we discover the most agonizing moment for Jesus as he bears your sin and my sin on his cross. Yes. As God judged our sin in the body of his son. And Jesus now feels the separation that sin had caused. Yes. The father had turned away, being unable to look at the sin that was placed now on Jesus. And it was at this moment 
that was completely foreign to Jesus. How many know that at this moment in time when Jesus cries out in, in desperation, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, why has thou forsaken me? How many know that it's because there had never been a moment in his eternal existence when his fellowship with the Father had been broken? Yes. And as Jesus bore your sin and my sin on the cross, he now literally becomes sin for us. And he endures this, thank you, Jesus. He endures this dreaded time of separation and desperation, even as 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 and 21 says that he hath made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us. He made him to be sin for you and I. He went to the cross so that we didn't have to go to the cross. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He who knew no sin, that we might be the righteousness of God thank in you, him. Jesus, thank you, Lord. I thank the Lord on tonight. Thank and you, as the clock keeps ticking, we then see another shift where he utters his sixth word, where he says, it is finished. And it is this statement that should then bring comfort to you and to, I, and to the body of Christ as a whole tonight, because somewhere in between his fourth word and his sixth word, we see the intimate relationship that was once separated as the clock keeps ticking. Now at the end of the day, somehow then reconnects because he goes back to the beginning and he says, Father, and how many know that Father points to the acceptance now? Listen to what I'm saying. Father points to the acceptance of his sacrifice that the penalty of sin had to pay. And so he says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Yes. And it's important here to note that what he really meant when he said I commend, we need to understand what commend really means in the original language of the text. Because commend in the Greek language of the text means to commit. In other words, think about it. Jesus was committed into the hands of the Roman soldiers, who then committed him into the hands of the Sanhedrin court, yes. who then committed him into the hands of Caiaphas, the high priest, who then committed him into the hands of Pontius Pilate, who ultimately washed his hands of the situation. Why? Because how many know that Pilate did not want to commit to the consent of the Lord's death? Yes. And so at the end of the day, what Jesus was saying was what that is saying that I've been in the hands of everybody else. And it was those hands that beat me all night. Yes. It was those hands that beat me with a catanine talus mm -hmm. that ripped the skin off my body. Hallelujah to God. Mm -hmm. They whipped him with something that had metal tassels and points on the end that when it hit his skin, it ripped his skin out of his body. It was those hands, Jesus was saying, that drove thorns into my head. And it was those hands that drove nails into my hands and my feet. And it was those hands, Jesus, Jesus was saying that drove a spear into my side and when I asked for something to drink Jesus said they gave me vinegar that took my breath and burned my face and so now at the end of the day what the Lord was saying is what some of us are saying at this very moment on tonight and somebody has been saying that I'm tired of being in the hands of people who don't appreciate me when all I did was love on them and all they did was spit in my face how many know they spit on the Lord's face they smacked him upside his head. They just crucified him and humiliate him. Somebody is saying tonight, I'm tired of being in the hands of people who only want to judge me. Somebody watching me tonight is saying that I'm tired of being in the hands of people who only want what I can do for them, but won't embrace me for who I am. And so at the end of the day, at the end of the day, essentially means to sum it all up. It means when it's all said and done. At the end of the day means to recap. And so at the end of the day, Jesus was saying, Father, I've completed the work that you've given me. And I want to be in your hands now because there's love in your hands. Jesus is saying, Father, there's strength in your hands. He's saying, Father, there's healing in your hands and there's peace in your hands. And Jesus was saying, I just want to be in your hand now. But before you bring me back, this is what he's saying to the Father. There's one more thing I got to do. You see, to commend something, brothers and sisters, in the Greek means to commit, as we stated earlier. It means to deposit as a trust and it means to protect. In other words, it's like when we go to the bank. When we go to the bank, how many know that we only put money in the bank knowing that we're going to come back one day only to withdraw it and to get it back because it's safe. It's 
our money is in good hands. It's, it's what Jesus was saying. And now Jesus begins to utter his last word. And what he says is now I'm determined to go down to hell and set captivity free. So he says, I'm going to leave this body right here in the bank. He says, I got to leave it right here so that I can go do what I got to do. Jesus knows that he's going to come back and he's going to get that same body. And he says that he commends and he commits it into safe hands of the father. And he then goes into the lower parts of the earth. He went back to the bank to get his body back. And how many of us realize that the bank was the tomb? The Bible says that he walked right into the tomb, put his body back on and walked right out of the tomb. And then says at the end of the day, I told y'all that I have power to lay down my life. And if I lay down my life, no man take it. I have power to take it up again. And so now you and I, brothers and sisters, at the end of the day, as prisoners of the Lord, appeal others to live a life that the Bible says is worthy of the call to which we have been called. That is to live a life that exhibits godly character, moral courage, personal integrity, and mature behavior. It is a life that expresses gratitude to God for our salvation with all humility, forsaking self-righteousness. How many know there's only one celebrity in Christendom and his name is Jesus Christ? And gentleness, the Bible says, maintaining self-control with patience, bearing with one another in unselfish love. Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you, Amen. making every every effort to, to keep the oneness of the spirit in the bond of peace. Each individual, the Bible says, working together to make the whole successful because there is one body of believers and one spirit, just as we are called to one hope when called to salvation. One God and Father of us all who is sovereign over all and working through all and get and living in all. Yet grace, God's undeserved favor, that is, was given to each one of us, not indiscriminately, but in different ways, in proportion to the measure of Christ's rich and abundant gift. Therefore, here's where I'm going. It says when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and he bestowed gifts on men. As Ephesians chapter number four, verses one through four and verses six through eight tells us. And now because of Jesus's redemptive work on Calvary's cross, how many know that now the scripture tells us that he is the one who says, I am he that liveth and was dead. He says, behold, look, I am alive forevermore and I got the keys of hell and death. Then we now can boldly declare, oh, death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? I'm grateful tonight for the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm grateful tonight for the redemptive work of Calvary on Calvary's cross that took place through the sacrificial suffering and death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. When I thought about this message that God gave us, Thank you know, I called it at one point the allegorical illusion. Thank you, Lord. And I called it the allegorical illusion because I want to encourage someone on tonight to look at what you're going through, to look at this quarantine time and what has hit our world as an allegory, allegorical illusion. In other words, to fully understand what I'm saying, an allegory is a narrative in which a character, a place, or an event is used to deliver a broader message. And so when Jesus asked why in our text, why hast thou forsaken me, Father? Why comes from the Greek word henati, which means for what purpose and for what reason? And the cross is the symbol that reveals God's purpose and it points to God's intention. In other words, Jesus knew the reason why he had to suffer. And it was because of his love for you and for me to deliver and to bring us out of bondage. Romans chapter number five, verses 14 to 17 tells us emphatically. It says that death ruled over mankind from Adam to Moses, the lawgiver, even over those who had not sinned as Adam did. Adam is a type of him, Christ that is, who was to come. But in reverse, Adam brought destruction through the sin, through his, uh, his disobedience in the garden. He says that Christ brought salvation, but the free gift of God is not like the trespass because the gift of grace overwhelms the fall of man. For if many died by one man's trespass, in other words, Adam's sin, much more abundantly did God's grace 
and the gift that comes by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, yes. overflowed to benefit the many. Thank you, Lord. Nor is the gift of grace like that which came through the one who sinned, that being Adam. For on the one hand, the judgment following the sin resulted from one trespass and brought condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift resulted from many trespasses and brought justification, or in other words, the release from sin's penalty, hallelujah, for us who believe. For if by the trespass of one, that being Adam, death reigned through one, Adam, much more surely will those, you and I, who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in eternal life through the one Jesus Christ. I'm so grateful that God has given me eternal life Hallelujah, that's come, that eternal life has come through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, his sacrificial death on Calvary's cross. And so before I close this message on tonight, I thought there was something that I wanted to bring to our attention in relation to what we see has befallen our world and we see what we're dealing with today. And it's something that someone called 12 things that Satan does to get victory over Christians. How many know the Bible tells us that Satan is the prince and power of the air of this world? And we're fighting against spiritual wickedness, the rulers of the darkness of this world, and we're fighting a, a, a spiritual battle. And so I want to talk about the 12 things that Satan does to mankind to get victory over Christians, which should then at the end of the day give us encouragement to understand what God has really done for us on this night that we call Good Friday. Now, number one, it says, Satan said to a con convention of his demons. As long as Christians stay close to God, we have no power over them. So here are 12 things you can do to get victory over Christians. This is what the enemy is saying. How many know that the Bible tells us in Psalm 133, which we know is a Psalm of elevation. The Bible says that when we walk in unity, it is there where God will command the blessing. And so the first thing Satan says is we need to keep them busy with non-essentials. Number two, he says, tempt them to overspend and go into debt. Number three, make them work long hours to maintain empty lifestyles. Number four, discourage them from spending family time together. For when their homes disintegrate, there is no refuge from work. Number five, overstimulate their minds with television and computers so they can't hear God speaking to them. Number six. Fill their coffee tables and nightstands and with newspapers and magazines so they have no time to read the Bible. Number seven, flood their mailboxes with sweepstakes promotions and get-rich-quick schemes to keep them chasing material things. Number eight, put glamour models on TV and on magazine covers to keep them focused on outward appearances. That way they will be dissatisfied with themselves and dissatisfied with their mates. Number nine, Satan says, make sure couples are too exhausted for physical intimacy so they will be tempted to look elsewhere. Number 10, make Santa and the Easter Bunny bigger than Jesus to divert them from remembering the real meaning of the holiday. Number 11, Satan says, involve them in good causes so they won't have time for eternal ones. Number 12, and lastly, Satan says, make them self-satisfied. Keep them busy working on their own strength so they'll never know the joy of God's power working through them. Remember, demons, this is what the enemy says. Keep them busy, 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 because we know what it stands for. Busy means being under Satan's yoke. Busy, being under Satan's yoke. And so I believe that in this time, the Lord has shut down our normal business and the busyness of life. And now we have an opportunity to redefine and reshape our priorities so that we can move in accordance with the frequency of God. Everything that the enemy has tried to keep our focus on and our attention span toward, God has allowed to shut down so that now we have an opportunity in the midst of this opposition so that we can get ourselves together. That on a night that we call Good Friday, when we should, in essence, call it Bad Friday. No, it is t entirely appropriate to call it Good Friday because of our sinful condition. And all of this pointed to God bringing us out of the hand of the enemy, giving us back the dominion that he wanted us to have in relationship when he created us in the earth. Because of Adam's sin, God came himself 
to become the sacrificial lamb. Jesus then has now become the, the, the fulfillment of all the types and shadows of the Old Testament to redeem us out of the bondage and the penalty of sin. And so tonight is Good Friday because of what Jesus intended for us. And that's why we call it an allegorical illusion. Mm -hmm. An allegorical illusion now then is something that has a greater spiritual or hidden meaning behind it. And so whatever you're going through tonight, I want to encourage you to understand that your pain has a purpose. Everything that Jesus suffered, how many know that it had a purpose? And that purpose was you and I. Yes. And so now God has called us and given us a tremendous privileged opportunity to get on his frequency so that we can stop moving in an abnormal rhythm and that we can move and operate in the vein and the pulse and the heartbeat of God. Yes. And so brothers and sisters on tonight, let's endeavor to unravel the yarn and disengage and separate the threads of our life. In other words, let's endeavor to disentangle ourselves from the intricacies and the complexities of this life. As Colossians chapter number three, verses one through four tells us where the word of God says, if you and I then have been raised with Christ, yes. let's desire those things which are above where Christ sits at the right hand of God. The Bible tells us that we ought to set our affection on things above, yes. not on things on the earth, because we are dead and our life is hidden with Christ in God. When, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then we shall also appear with him in glory. Amen. We have to understand if my life and your life is hidden in Christ, God has given us an opportunity to find it. And that's why he said, Amen. he that loseth his life shall find it, but he that findeth his life shall lose it. Yes. And so at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, yeah. Good Friday is good because it ushered in our deliverance. And so let us stay close to the Lord on tonight and separate ourselves from the world. And let us seek comfort in prayer tonight. We know that a day of vengeance is coming because the Bible emphatically tells us that. A vengeance of the day of vengeance is coming on this world. And how many know that before it comes, you and I are to expect tribulation and suffering. But because we look, for these things, we are to we we should not be restless and dismayed and discouraged nor fearful. No, we uh, we ought not let these things come upon us. But we have to be reposed and we have to be resolved and we have to be encouraged in the Lord our God and His redemptive work on Calvary and continue to abide in Him. Where how many know that we're kept safe while we wait patiently for the fulfillment of God's promises. Be encouraged on tonight, brothers and sisters. Understand that tonight is a night of great promises. The Last Supper was indeed the finishing of the old covenant, and it was about to be the ushering in of a new covenant. And this the dispensation of grace wherein we're standing on tonight. So I'm just so grateful that I had the opportunity once again to come into your, to your homes on tonight. I want you to know we're praying for you right here at Hours of Deliverance and Faith Ministries. You can inbox us. Whatever you need us to do, we're there for you. We're praying for you. And so we hope that you come back on Sunday where we'll be rejoicing in the Lord's resurrection on Easter Sunday. Hallelujah. But how many know that even though Jesus suffered, he bled and he died? How many know that on the third day he rose from the grave and he told us that he would raise, he would be risen again? And so I hope to see you right back here on Strength for the Journey. I'm Pastor Scotty Miller, and I'm so grateful that I had an opportunity to minister to you on tonight. So be encouraged and know that God has a plan in the midst of this great time of calamity and strength. Understand that God is still yet in control and God is still yet going to bless you. God bless you on tonight.